Hi, today I'm going to be doing the Equilibrium Systems Lab. Now, this one is just an introductory to the concept of equilibrium, chemical equilibrium. Uh, as such, there won't be any math involved. So when you get to this part in the um, uh, Mastering Chemistry assignment, you will see that it's a pretty simple chapter. Uh, just the qualitative aspects is all that we're going for today. Um, now, there are some uh, interesting logical things that we'll uh, go to get go through together, or I'll go through on the board here and get you uh, the concepts. Now, um, I like to s start with the idea of uh, what is equilibrium. Now, there's a couple of different kinds of equilibrium. There is what's known as a static equilibrium, which um, would be something that is balanced. You know, like our set of weights on two sides of a, a traditional uh, scale balance. And if it's just sitting there, not moving, then it's in static equilibrium. Okay? Now, that's in contrast to what we actually deal with for chemistry, chemical systems, chemical equilibriums, and many other types. Uh, equilibriums that you might encounter in other fields, such as biology, uh, ecology, which is, of course, part of biology, but uh, that is dynamic equilibriums. Dynamic equilibriums have a bulk average that stays constant, but if you get down to the small scale, um, it's changing. Rapidly or constantly changing at a small enough scale. And that's what we have in um, chemical equilibrium systems. Now, your textbook gives a good uh, illustration with respect to cars in a city and cars in the uh, surrounding countryside, the number of cars that is. And I like to give another uh, analogy uh, to get the, uh, start getting the points across about equilibrium. It's an e analogy from ecology. Or no, it's not really an analogy, it's an actually an example from ecology. Um, and that would be something like the predator-prey system of, say, a stereotypical uh, fox and rabbit um, system. So if you take an ecological system which the, uh, the primary predator is the fox and the prey is the rabbit, and you make you know, this very simplified uh, idea, uh, ideal system, and you say, okay, I'm going to have um, uh, a certain number of foxes in there, and they're going to live in, in, at a certain population that's going to be stable as long as there's enough rabbits to feed them, okay, enough bunnies. And the bunnies will live and maintain a certain population as long as there's not too many foxes to hunt them down and eat them and deplete their populations faster than they can replenish them, right? So that would be a dynamic ecological system in which uh, the bulk number of foxes stays constant over time, and the number of rabbits stays constant over time, unless you do uh, disturbance. And that's what we're going to do in our uh, lab this afternoon, is set a chemical equilibrium system up, and then do things to disturb equilibrium and observe the change. And so if you take the fox and rabbit analogy, you say, okay, I'm going to uh, take this little ecosystem that was in balance, and I'm going to drop in, you know, a thousand more rabbits, bunnies that the foxes like to eat. Well, what's that going to do to, to, um, to the system? Well, uh, that's called a disturbance um, or a, a stress was added to the system, an overabundance of rabbits. Well, the foxes are going to start pigging out, right? So they'll start to use up the rabbits that you added, you could say. Using the, they consume the bunnies in excess. And as a result, the foxes are able to uh, reproduce more than uh, they would otherwise have been able to because they got so much food. And, and they'll continue to eat the excess bunnies and make more foxes until the number of foxes uh, that are, are present is now in equilibrium because they start to consume more rabbits when their population, the fox population is up and the rabbit population starts to... Um, uh, level off, and equilibrium is reestablished, right? That's what happens in a dynamic equilibrium system when you disturb it. 
it, uh, you could say, spontaneously shifts to reestablish equilibrium, okay? And in doing so, you can uh, derive a couple of uh, ideas, ideas to apply, or ideas to apply, called the Le Chatelier's Principle. A couple of ways of applying Le Chatelier's Principle. That's a French guy who came up with the idea of dynamic equilibriums applied to chemical systems. Okay, Le Chatelier. And we're going to uh, uh, go through those ideas uh, of applying Le Chatelier's Principle on the board here. All right. The system that we're going to use in the lab, and I'll come back to the fox and rabbit uh, analogy in just a second. Um, the system that we're going to have, the chemical system that we're going to have in lab, consists of um, the iron, uh, cation, okay, that's a ferric ion, uh, it's in a 3 plus uh, oxidation state, and it's in an aqueous solution, okay. Now, that's the uh, principal ion that's involved in the equilibrium system that we're going to be interested in. Okay, but as we'll see in the lab, this iron is going to come from uh, an iron nitrate solution. Okay, so this is an iron nitrate solution that is uh, going to you know, be an aqueous solution, and that's where we get the iron from. Okay, but we're not really too interested in the nitrate. So in the equilibrium, uh, to set it up, we're going to add an anion that is known as the thiocyanate anion. Okay, it's a, uh, going to come from a potassium thiocyanate solution. Okay, that's where we get uh, the thio is for sulfur and cyanate. So anytime you hear the term thio or thi in a chemical name or a product name, there's a good chance that it indicates a sulfur is in that compound. Okay, so that's thiocyanate. And that's uh, going to uh, also, of course, be aqueous. And so we're going to take an iron nitrate solution, which, again, we're just interested in the iron, a potassium thiocyanate solution to get the thiocyanate. We're going to mix them. Now, they start out as, uh, well, the thiocyanate starts out as colorless. Okay? And the iron solution, if it's concentrated enough, has a is a light uh, yellow color, a clear yellow color. And, you know, it has to be concentrated enough to be able to see it um, because it's not a very uh, highly visible color. Now, when you mix these two, though, what happens is uh, they form a complex, what's known as the iron thiocyanate complex. And the simplified way to write that is just one iron with one thiocyanate, and, of course, if it's in this form, then you have a negative uh, combined with a cation, which has three positives, and that would give this complex, which still have a two positive charge, and that's uh, easily able to be held still in the aqueous solution, so it doesn't solidify or anything of the sort. It's just an, a new ion uh, floating around the solution. It's uh, referred to as a complex, and it has a very visible red color, like a brick red. I'll put brick red. You can, des you can describe it some other way once you see it in the, uh, in the upcoming experiment, okay? But that starts out as a nice uh, red color, and it's highly visible, so that will easily overcome uh, any slight tinge of yellow that you may have had from the iron over here. You won't be able to really detect it when you first mix these two solutions at a reasonable concentration. Now, how does this relate to equilibrium? Well, this complex isn't very strong, okay? It's the uh, thiocyanate is kind of a big, bulky anion, and it's held loosely on the iron, okay? Kind of a weak bond, uh, relatively speaking, for a chemical bond. Now, as such, it's very easily, uh, relatively easily broken apart and goes right back to the original ion. Let's uh, look at the analogy from the book and apply it to this. Um, it's the uh, cars in the city versus cars outside of the city. Let's say um, uh, there's no cars in the city at first because um, it was just built. Okay, it just make something up here. And all these cars are outside and they say, oh, wow, there's a new shining city that we want to go and see. And, and uh, Okay, that's whenever you 
first mix these two solutions. These are the cars, and they're all going to say, oh, there's nothing over here at first. There's no cars over there. So we're all going to rush into the city, and they're going to form the product, okay? So when you first mix your two solutions, uh, all you get is practically one-way traffic into the city, forming the product. But as the, uh, the city uh, builds up its population, and, you know, it becomes crowded and could be congested, people get tired of the city, or they're done working, what are they going to do? They're going to go back to the surrounding uh, suburbs or countryside, right? So the traffic is going to start going back to the left. And the idea is, eventually, as many people going into the city will equal the number of people coming out of the city. And so that's the rate transfer is the same in both directions. So the rate at which, uh, the, I'm going to put it in chemical terms now, the rate at which the product is formed equals the rate at which it's unformed. That's after you've built up enough product, right? Because at first, all you have is pure, pure reactants, and they're going to just form product, okay? Well, as soon as you start building product, then it's going to start breaking apart to go back to the reactants because it's not a very strong complex, right? Well, um, as the amount of product builds up, so too does the amount of uh, product going backwards to remake our reactants over here. And so it'll build up, build up until it reaches this concentration at which the amount of product getting broken apart equals the amount of product getting formed at that point the concentration of the product is constant. It's stable in time. Okay? Um, if you were to uh, draw a graph of it, then, you know, you could do this very easily. Um, you know, you start out with uh, concentration. You say this is concentration. And um, uh, down here initially, the concentration of the uh, so the product will be zero, it'll go up rapidly and start to level off. And so this would be the iron uh, thiocyanate complex. Okay, and then initially though, the uh, concentration of the reactants are high. What if they come down to here? Okay, fine. So that would be the iron concentration and the thiocyanate concentration. They start up high and they go down as the iron uh, thiocyanate complex is formed, right? So um, they don't go to zero though. And that's an important idea to keep in mind. Okay? Because at equilibrium you have the product that is formed in some concentration and that, you know, is unformed and it's reforming the reactants. So the reactants are still present at equilibrium, at some concentration. It's just a question of what is the concentration of the reactants and what is the concentration of the product at equilibrium. And that's uh, where you can start introducing uh, some math, some numerical values, which we're going to skip. Okay? But that's the general idea. And if you have any questions, of course, please email me or you can leave a comment in the comment section of this video, of course. Now, uh, so, once the system has achieved equilibrium, uh, the reactant's concentration stays constant, the average stays constant, and the products stay constant in time. That's what this axis you say is. It's time down there. Well, what if we do something to disturb the equilibrium? And that's where you can come back to the uh, predator-prey analogy. Um, in that analogy, I said, well, we're going to dump a bunch of rabbits in there. What's going to happen? The, the, the foxes are going to start, you know, pigging out on rabbit. And uh, they're consuming what you added. Now, the Chatelier's principle says, uh, if you disturb a system at equilibrium, it will shift in a manner to counter your disturbance and thereby reestablish equilibrium. All right, so let's put that into more practical terms. If you add something... To a component of the equilibrium system is going to shift to use up what you add. So if you add something to a system at equilibrium, it will shift to use up what you add. Let's apply it to um, this equilibrium system here. Okay. Keep in mind that at equilibrium, again, we have 
products present and reactants present. It's just a question of how much. Now, if you suddenly go in there and <coughs> dump in a bunch of iron, now your system was already established with its equilibrium, it had a nice brick red color, because like I said, the brick red is a very dark color compared to uh, this very light yellow, but suddenly you went in there and you dumped in iron. That's like dumping in rabbits into the system. You say, well, how is that going to affect the equilibrium? So if I add iron, the system will shift to use it up, and it can do that because the thiocyanate that is still in that system will react with the extra iron that's been added and make more products. So we would say it, it, uh, adding iron would cause the equilibrium to shift to the right to make more products. And what would we expect the color change to do? That's what the actual experiment is going to be all about. It's going to be about finding the color changes that uh, result from the disturbance of the systems that are at equilibrium. So it starts out with a, a, you know, a nice color, but then we add more iron, you know, and then you think, oh, I'm adding yellow, so it's going to turn yellow. No, uh, yellow is a very light color, and when you add the uh, iron, it will immediately start to be consumed and form more of this very dark color. So instead of uh, getting more yellow, it'll get more red. It'll get darker red. That would be the predicted uh, results. Okay. Any questions on that? You know what to do. Uh, now, let's look at uh, the other scenario. Let's say that in the fox and uh, rabbit system, I go in there and I um, remove a bunch of rabbits. Instead of you know, dumping in rabbits, I go in and I just uh, trap and hunt out a thousand rabbits. What's going to happen to the system that was at equilibrium? Well, Le Chatelier's principle says, it will shift in a manner to counter the disturbance and reestablish equilibrium. That's the Le Air's principle. So in this case, I took something away. I took away the rabbits. Well, what's going to happen to those foxes? A lot of them are going to start going hungry, right? And if they start going hungry, the fox population is going to start decreasing. Okay? If the fox population decreases, guess what that allows the rabbits that are remaining to do? And so they will start to replenish their population. The rabbit population will start to get replenished because the foxes, the prey, the predator, rather the predator, start to decrease its amount and allows the rabbits to replenish their population. Well, that's the idea. That's the practical application. If you take something away from a system that is at equilibrium, it will shift in a manner to replenish what you took away. That's the second way to apply Le Chatelier's principle. Okay? The first way uh, we covered with if you add it, it will shift to use it up. The second way is if you take something out, the equilibrium system will shift to replenish what you took out. Okay? So let's look at it in terms of the iron again. Okay? The iron, we're going to do this in the lab um, and more, and I'm just going to think of it in terms of the iron at the moment. Uh, so, if I go into, I mix my two solutions initially, I got my initial brick red color, and then I go in there and I do something to the system to take out the iron, decrease the iron amount. What's going to happen to the equilibrium system? Well, uh, uh, these guys will split apart, or these guys, this compound, the iron thiocyanate, will split apart to uh, replenish the iron that was taken away. Okay? So the complex will uh, shift to the left, or you say the equilibrium will shift to the left to replenish the iron that was taken away. Okay? Okay, and that would make more iron. Until there's enough iron that it will hit the thiocyanate and again, you know, be in equilibrium with the amount of complex that is formed. So that is the Le Chatelier's principle applied. Now, the next part is instead of uh, adding uh, actual chemical component, or taking away a chemical component, it's dealing with heat, which I mentioned at the beginning, uh, that this is a temperature-dependent equilibrium system. This plus this, you know, sure, it makes a complex, but it also, a bond forming, which is, you know, a complex bond is forming here, uh, is generally an exothermic process, so it'll um, give off a little bit of heat. So, all right, um, well, I'm just going to write it down here. Uh, this 
plus heat is also a product. Okay, so heat is a product. It's a you know it's a very slight exothermic reaction, but it is still uh, exothermic. So it gives off heat. Whenever you have an exothermic system, you can write heat as one of the products. If you have an endothermic system, you would put heat on the reactant side. You say that heat plus these reactants cause this product. Okay, but if it's an exothermic, then you put heat on the product side. And once you have it down there, then you can logic through the effect that heat will have using Le Chatelier's principle. Okay? So, um, if I go into this system here and then I add more heat to the system, what's going to happen? Well, apply it the same way that we did earlier. If you add something to the system at equilibrium, it will shift to use up what you added. Okay, so if I add heat, how can it shift to use it up? Well, the heat plus the complex shifts to the left, or moves to the left. That makes these reactants. And so it would use up the heat by breaking up the complex and shifting to the left. What's going to happen to the color? What do you predict would happen to the color? Well, if the complex is decreasing in concentration as it gets broken apart by the heat, the red color is going to start to decrease. So we would predict that the solution becomes lighter red and possibly more yellow, right? That makes fairly decent sense. And then in the opposite, uh, uh, you expect the opposite scenario if you take heat away, which would be equivalent to chilling it or decreasing the temperature on it. Um, the complex will be able to form more easily and it stays more stable at low temperatures. So you'll be able to have a greater amount of it. And so you'd expect, if anything, to see the color be darker red at um, lower temperatures when you take the heat out. Okay, so that's um, the bulk of everything that applies to the lab. What we have, uh, what I have left to mention in here is also, it's also covered in the regular um, mass and chemistry stuff, is a different type of system, a gas phase system. Okay, so this is aqueous system. I'm going to go ahead and erase this one. I'm going to put up here a typical uh, gas phase equilibrium system that you'll have to deal with in the regular class, online class material for your assignments. All right, now this reaction is one of the most important reactions you could say in modern uh, life. Okay, it's one of the foundational reactions. In, uh, in all, well, in a great deal of industries. And that's taking just nitrogen gas from the air, literally taking nitrogen gas from the air, I mean, we breathe, nitrogen gas is like 70% of the air that we breathe, and um, mixing it with hydrogen gas, which can be obtained very easily from uh, different sources, uh, and producing uh, ammonia, NH3 gas. Okay, now this is called the, or the Bosch Haber, uh, Haber, you might pronounce it Haber, um, system or reaction. Uh, Fritz Haber, Fritz Haber, Fritz Haber, I want to say Haber, Fritz Haber um, is uh, a famous chemist in history uh, who is actually known as the father of chemical warfare because he developed a great number of chemical uh, gas methods to gas the enemies during World War I. He was on the Germans' side and um, the irony, uh, one of the greatest ironies in the history of science, I believe, is that, you know, he developed all these chemical warfare uh, methods, and his work led to uh, the creation of Zyklon B, directly to the creation of Zyklon B, which was a uh, Nazi death camp uh, gas, and he did, you know, multiple other things uh, on behalf of uh, chemical warfare, hence his title. But the irony is that this reaction is at the base of the fertilizer industry. As such, um, 
people were able to mass produce ammonium nitrate fertilizers, which allowed the green revolution of the 20th century, which has credited with saving millions of people from starvation because of this uh, ammonium nitrate fertilizers. Um, and so because of that, Fritz Haber was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 1919. I'm going to provide a video link below in the descriptions for this video to a short little uh, show about Fritz Haber, bio about Fritz Haber, and how ironic his life truly was. He made this in order to uh, have a source of ammonia that could be conveniently converted to nitrate, which is the base of the uh, ammunition industry, the explosives. And he did this so the Germans could continue with their war efforts because the Allies had cut off uh, the Germans' um, source of nitrates, uh, a mineral from which you could extract nitrate to make uh, explosives. The Allies had cut that off, and so now they had a way to do it from just gases in the air, practically. What we wanted to get to real fast here, though, is the fact that uh, this is a gas-based system, and there's another effect that we have to take into account, and that's called the pressure, because gases are highly susceptible to pressure changes, or sensitive to pressure changes. So, if you look at the um, reaction here, there's a problem, and it's not balanced. It's not a balanced chemical reaction. So, in order to balance it, all you need to do is say, okay, um, I like to start with the biggest, most complex uh, molecule in the system, which in this case is ammonia, and just go through it atom by atom, or element by element, and balance each element as we encounter in the formula of the most uh, complicated uh, molecule in this reaction. So the first molecule, or the first element is nitrogen. So you say, well, how many nitrogens are there on the right-hand side? Just one. Well, we need at least one nitrogen on the, on the other side, the reactor side, but there's two. So that's not balanced, obviously. So we need the same number of nitrogens on both sides. So in order to get two over here, all we need to do is put a, a coefficient there. And now we have two nitrogens on both sides. So the nitrogens are balanced. Well, how many hydrogens? You go to the next element now. Hydrogen. How many hydrogens are there? Well, there's two times three. So it's uh, three per ammonia molecule. That's six total hydrogens. And we need six hydrogens on the reactor side. Well, that's easy. All you got to do is put a three here. And now we have three hydrogen molecules. So that's three times two. That's six hydrogen atoms, right? Six hydrogen atoms on both sides. Two nitrogen atoms on both sides. The reaction is balanced. Okay. Now, that's very important. You have to have a balanced reaction in order to apply the Le Chatelier's principle to a gas phase system. Because we need to know the number of molecules. We treat all the gas molecules the same and we say, okay, if you uh, look on the left hand side, how many gas molecules are there on the reactor side? Well, I have one nitrogen gas molecule and three hydrogen gas molecules. That's four gas molecules on the left hand side. How many gas molecules do I have on the right? Just two ammonia molecules. So, when you pressurize a system, think about this, if you're, um, well, uh, if you got a bunch of people crammed into a small room, that's going to be uh, more pressure. What can you do to relieve that pressure? Get rid of some of those people. They need to have their uh, six feet distance around them on all sides, so you got to kick out some people from that room. And... Um, by getting less people, there's less pressure in that room. It's the same with gas molecules. Um, by getting, uh, if, you, if you increase, you basically you shrink the size of the room, that would be equivalent to increasing the pressure in the room, um, then more and more people are going to want to get out of there, right? So for the gas phase equilibrium system, when you pressurize it, that's equivalent to shrinking the volume, and more gas molecules are going to want to uh, get out of there. How can that happen? Well, we got on the reactor side four gas molecules. If four gas molecules get together to form two gas molecules, then that got rid of four and replaced it with two. That's half as many. So if you pressurize a gas phase system at equilibrium, it will shift to the side with less gas molecules. That's the general uh, rule. Okay, so I pressurize my uh, uh, Equilibrium system had initially had nitrogen, hydrogen, and ammonia all at equilibrium. I pressurize it; it's going to shift to the side with less gas molecules. That'll make it make more ammonia. Okay.
Okay, so that's one of the big things that Fritz Haber discovered or, or figured out was how much pressure could you apply in order to get ammonia, maximize the amount of ammonia production. Well, the opposite case happens when you decrease pressure. If you make a bigger and bigger room, more and more people can go in there and be comfortable. So um, if you make a bigger gas chamber, then more and more gas molecules can fill it up. So the equilibrium will shift to the side with more gas molecules. If you decrease the pressure, equilibrium of a gas phase system shifts to the side with more gas molecules. Decrease the pressure, it shifts to the side with more gas molecules. Increase the pressure, it shifts to the side with less gas molecules. Okay, that's it. That's the two different types of equilibrium systems, equilibrium systems that you need to know for this introductory uh, chapter. Okay? Now we need to get to lab. All right, so your um, procedure says to start with um, a 0.01 molar iron nitrate solution. That's what I got here. Okay. Uh-oh. Missing my light. Okay, I got my goggles on. So, what is molar? What does that mean? It means molarity, which is a unit of concentration, perhaps the most common unit of concentration used by chemists. Um, what is molarity? Well, it means, so I'm going to write it on this piece of paper and flash it on the screen for you here. And of course, you can look this up in your books. Molarity means um, moles of solute per um, liter of solution. All right. So... That's it pretty easily. And so for us, it practically means 0 0.01 moles of, in this case, iron nitrate per liter of the solution. So that's what it means. Now commonly we write it as uh, 0 0.01 molar Iron nitrate. Okay. Oh, you see that? Now, um, what we got is one other thing. Anytime you write it like this, I'm just going to put it over here like this. This is also equivalent to putting it in square brackets. Okay, and saying, um, what is the what is the concentration of the iron, cation? Well, if you know the concentration of the iron nitrate and you see there's one iron per formula, then um, the concentration of the iron is equal to the concentration of the iron nitrate, obviously. So when you put it in square brackets in chemistry, that means concentration of whatever is in those brackets in units of molarity. So that means... Uh, 0 0.01 molar iron cation. Okay, there you go. So that's what it says. That's what it means when we say it's 0 0.01 molar iron nitrate or 0 0.01 molar iron or ferric, the ferric cation. That's what we're dealing with. Okay, and the same goes for the uh, potassium thiocyanate. We're going to have a 0.01 molar solution of potassium thiocyanate. Okay, hope you all can see that good. That's our starting solutions. And if you read the procedure, it says to uh, measure out, I think, 20 drops of each of these into eight tubes. So I got uh, eight test tubes here. Well, there you go. Eight test tubes here. And we have 20 drops of iron into each one, 20 drops of potassium thiocyanate into each one, and then 20 drops of water into each one. So that's 60 drops per tube times 8. That's 480 drops that we would have to count. I don't know why the directions are written that way. That is completely ridiculous to try to count 480 drops. Um, so there's a couple of ways of doing it. And instead, much easier ways, and that the way I normally tell my class is to measure one milliliter instead of counting 20 drops because 20 drops, standard size drops from a dropper, is about one milliliter. So you put one milliliter of iron solution, one milliliter of the thiocyanate 
and one milliliter of water into each of these tubes. So they all end up with three total milliliters um, in them. And the goal is to make all eight of them start out the same, the same amount of each of these solutions. So they all have the same initial color change. Okay? Um, I'm going to do it even more simple than this. I know that I can be pretty darn consistent with my squirt from a dropper. I'm just going to pull it up, drop it in. And I'm going to use the same squirt every single time in eight tubes. And I'm going to bet that this is good enough to be uh, able to tell apart any changes due to the disturbances or the stresses that we're going to put on these tubes as we go through the procedure. So for the setup, I'm just going to squirt iron, equal amount of iron into each one, equal amount of potassium thiocyanate, and an equal amount of water into each one. Okay? So. starting solutions. I tried to give them a nice white background so maybe you can uh, compare the colors uh, pretty well. And the idea is to compare the uh, darkness of the red color, how, uh, how it changes as we go through the stresses for the experiment. Uh, if you look on your data sheet, this is the Anything that you have to fill in as we go through this procedure here. The stresses are the things that we are going to do to these eight tubes. Actually, uh, tube number one will be our control. You want to write down your observations, describe the color, that kind of thing right here for tube number one. And then uh, for tube number two, we're going to follow the directions and do what it says for the stress and write down any observations and say whether or not that indicates what the equilibrium shift was. So I'm going to leave you guys to decide what it is. I may not say what it is. You need to write it based on your observations of the color change. Okay, so for step number two, we needed to, well, I'm sorry, for a, a test tube. I'm going to call this one right here our test tube number one is going to be our control. All right, um, and test tube number two, I'm gonna do the first stress on the procedure, which is adding some more iron. So if you look at the procedure, it says to add 0.1 molar iron nitrate. We started with 0.01, so this is more concentrated iron, and that way it'll have a quicker effect on the system which does have an effect. So I'm gonna, it says to add, um, what is it, one milliliter, or no, 10 drops of it in there. So I'm going to add 10 drops of the iron. Double check that amount here. Yeah, it says 10 drops. Now, that was if you started with the recommended amount. Remember, I started with just a squirt rather than exactly one milliliter. So 10 drops or something around there. The point is to if it has an effect on the equilibrium and we can tell by the color change. Alright, so take off this top and the next drop is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And a couple more for good measure. And commence stirring. Have to have good mixing. Okay. What do you think happened? Compared to this one, what does this one look like in terms of its color? And what does that indicate about the equilibrium shift? if any. Let me go ahead and add a couple more just for good measure to see if we can get uh, a stronger effect. I think I see a good effect. 
There we go. So you make your observations and write them down. That would be the first stress was adding iron cation and ferric cation. Put your observations on color changes and anything else seems relevant. And you say, does that e indicate an equilibrium shift to the right or to the left um, based on that color change? Okay. So, see a color change? I think I see something. I'm not going to say what. Okay, the next step was, is, the next step is to add 0.1 molar potassium thiocyanate to our next tube over. So that would be tube number three on the table. And I'm going to add in several drops. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. That's good, okay. Now, commence mixing. Now, what do we do? We compare this one to our control number one over here. What does this one look like in terms of the, the uh, color? All right, so you got that one. Well, what's the next effect? Or the next stress? The next stress says to um, do three molar sodium hydroxide. Well, it just so happens that I got six, six molar potassium hydroxide. It's the hydroxide that is going to cause an effect, if anything. The hydroxide is a uh, base anion. It's a strong base. And this is more concentrated, so if it does have an effect, it'll have a quicker effect than the three molar sodium hydroxide. Whether you have sodium or potassium is arbitrary for this procedure. It's the hydroxide that matters and the amount of hydroxide. So if this is a strong base. You need to definitely be careful if you're ever messing with this stuff because it will quickly convert skin into soap and burn like crazy at this concentration level. All right, so make sure you wear your eyes too. I mean, sorry, wear your goggles. So here we go. I'm going to put that into this tube and it says like five drops or four drops. I'm just going to drop in a good many. Wait, it's um, this one. Okay. All right, so this is tube number four. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Three. Oh my goodness. Whoa, that is definitely an effect. I didn't even have to stir. What happened to that color? Well, it definitely looks yellow. Now remember what I wrote on the board. What color did the iron solution start out as if it's concentrated enough? That's right. So what does this indicate about the direction of the equilibrium shift compared to the red color that we started with? Mm-hmm. So, um... I can explain that chemistry a little bit more. The hydroxide is an anion. Or the OH is an anion. It's negatively charged. The potassium is cation. Positive charge. Now, as we know, the iron cation is positive. And if the hydroxide is negative, we put in all these strong negative charges in there. They are going to latch on to the iron and remove it, you could say. Effectively remove iron from the solution. And if you remember what we said on the board, you take out iron, the equilibrium will shift to replenish it. And in order to do that, it shifts to the left. So I kind of gave that away on that one. But that's an important one because it's not obvious as obvious on the chemistry. You took out iron using hydroxide. And that caused this equilibrium shift right here. Okay, what's the next procedure? Actually, I'm going to skip ahead here in the interest of time to step G. And just to get it started, you see step G says to prepare an ice bath and put one of these tubes into it. So we're going to observe the effect of removing heat. So an ice bath is a whole lot of ice with a little bit of water. We want uh, to maximize the cold, so we need a, as much ice, a little bit of water to make sure that when we submerge our tube, it will be in full contact with the cold, maximum contact with the cold. Now, 
This is um, going to be tube number seven. So I'm going to go ahead and take out tube number seven here and start chilling it in the ice bath so that we can see what the effect is because you have to wait for 10 minutes according to the directions. And so we'll just have it chilling while we're doing the rest of the procedures here. Okay. Okay, set that one over here. All right. Now, on to the next one right here. We just did hydroxide. And now we need to do acid, hydrochloric acid. I have a three molar solution of hydrochloric acid. I want to see if I can find the stronger stuff to have a more drastic effect, if any. Okay, I found it. Six molar hydrochloric acid. Notice I put some gloves on. Yes, folks, I should have been wearing gloves when I had the six molar potassium hydroxide as well. I'm not sure which one is more hazardous. They are both mean things to deal with. They will eat your skin up very quickly. So, nitrile gloves are good protections for most aqueous solutions. So, six molar hydrochloric acid. Let's add it and see what happens. All right. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine drops. I definitely see an effect already. Let's do a little stirring. Hmm. Is that a big enough effect for you guys? Compare it to the control side by side. Actually, this one's a good control right next to it because we haven't done anything to this one yet. Let's get that lighting to be about the same. Yeah, I see it in a definite effect. But let's make it a little bit, see if we can make it a little bit more notable. Maybe 10, 11, 12, 13. Okay, now we've got a good many drops in there, 14 or so drops. Now the idea is that this is the effect of the chemical that we're observing, not the effect of just dilution. Because of course if we diluted this with just water enough, then that will lighten up all the colors. So that to me looks like it is a lighter color than this one over here. In fact, we added about 14 drops of acid to this one. We could add, you know, that many drops of water to this one and see if that is any different. That would be a good way to control it. So this will just be a little extra on the side to note. I'm going to add that many drops of water to this one for a control. Uh, 14. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. Okay. And now we can stir. and compare. So this one isn't as big of a difference in the color, but I hope it shows up on the video well enough. I can definitely see it in person. This one is lighter and that's got to be a chemical effect, not just a dilution effect because we diluted this one just now. And like I said, that's extra. It's not in the directions, but that's a more fair comparison between them. Okay. So the acid one is lighter, so you record that. Now, we are on to this one here, which is um, after the acids and bases, step F says to prepare a hot water bath. All right, and add the tube to the hot water bath. Let's see what that will do. All right, you guys weren't looking. I set up a hot water bath right here. All right, that's getting nice and toasty. And here is that tube number six. And well, hmm, we could put it in the hot water bath. Yeah, I guess we'll go ahead and do that. And it's kind of sitting there for a few minutes to see the effect. Now we know that uh, step G was the cold water bath. And that's still chilling. We'll let it chill a little bit longer. And while that's chilling, 
we'll go on to step H. Whoa. Oh, careful there. Sorry. All right, step H is going to be this one. Let me move my control over here. I have the control and the one that we're going to do step H in side by side here. Step H is adding, adding a new compound, sodium phosphate, sodium hydrogen phosphate. And this one is um, different from the uh, iron hydroxide because it has a different anion, hydrogen phosphate. And iron will form a complex with hydrogen phosphate, similar to how hydroxide formed a complex. The hydroxide just turned the uh, yellow color over here, but let's see what happens when this complex, the iron cation, see the HPO4, the HPO4 is hydrogen phosphate, and that is an anion. Okay, and that will, uh, it's a negatively two charged anion, and the HPO4 negatively two charged anion will latch onto the iron cations and remove them. Let's see how they do when we add it to this one. All right, here we go. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. Oh, yeah, that's a good many drops. Okay. Well, you can already see an effect on the color. Let's commence stirring. Let's see what that does. Oh, man, that is definitely disappearing, looks like. Turning just a little. How to do? Ooh, man, that's nice. It went to a very light yellow color. Very, very light yellow compared to the iron hydroxide one. And to me, all that that indicates is that the hydrogen phosphate, here's the iron, here's the hydrogen phosphate. The hydrogen phosphate is more effective at removing the iron than the hydroxide um, forms a stronger complex. So that's the observation with this one. So again, when you write down the observations of the changes and then you say, does that tell you whether the equilibrium shifted to the left towards reactants or to the right towards products based on that color change? And that's uh, the basis for the lab. Let's go to the hot and cold observations over here. Okay, so here's the control, ding, ding. and here's the hot one. You see a difference? Yeah, some. Let's leave it in there a little bit longer. Okay, and the hardest one to observe, and from a past experience, the hardest one to see the clear change or difference is the cold water bath. The cold one. So let me go ahead and bring that one up here and see if we can notice the cold difference. Put it over here. Okay. Here's the control, and here's the cold. Fogs up is one thing that makes it a little bit more difficult. And, yeah, definitely difficult to see any differences between the control and the cold. Let me go get some more ice. Alright, here is the hot one. The hot is on the right. Wait back down here. The hot one is on the right, and the control is on the left. Which one looks more yellow? Uh, it's pretty clear from where I can see it in person. I'm just hoping it comes across in the video here nicely. The hot one definitely has a more yellowish, lighter color to it. Okay. Well, the cold is on the left, and the control is on the right. I'm struggling to see any difference here, so you 
could record that one as no observable effect. So there you have it folks, that is the experiment, I hope you enjoyed this video, stay tuned for the next one.